My case is built around historical documents and, and evidence on the, on the ground that backs it up. Uh, this presentation consists of four elements. First is the, tradi the traditional story, then I shall tell you what's wrong and where the invasion and battle really took place. Uh, then the evidence that we've found, uh, then what happens next. I'm only going to deal with primary sources, those within 180 years of the battle, who were not taking their information from third parties. That really cuts it down. The closer you are to the events of the time, the more accurate, theoretically, we are talking about. But remember, 180 years from the battle is the equivalent of us talking about a battle that took place in 1830. It's really still quite distant even then. What is the traditional story? The Normans landed uh, left St. Valery in France on the evening of the 28th of September, 1066. Michaelmas was the day they arrived. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, one of the best sources of the English written history, tell us that Count William came from Normandy to Pevensey on Michaelmas Eve, and soon they were able to move on and they built a castle at Hastings. So here is the coast today. I hope everybody can see this. And as soon as they were able, they moved to Hastings where they built a castle. They, they marched down the coast as we were all taught in school. But I lived in Crowhurst. Each year, I would look out of my window about this time of the year uh, and I would see this, a valley full of water between Becks Hill and Hastings. Water that goes all the way down to the coast. So the traditional story that they marched down the coast from Pevensey, in, in my mind, could not possibly be right. So I, I went to see Simon Jennings, but the most important scientist who has ever worked in the Crowhurst Valley, which is called the Coombe Haven. Uh, he was a sedimentologist working for the University of London, uh, and he had carried out auger tests, with, uh, which are boreholes in the marsh. He had studied the pollen records uh, and studied the sed sediments of this valley, which showed sea levels now and in 1066. Sediments proved that there was water from the coast right the way, right the way up to Crowhurst, which is at the top there, and no invading army could have crossed it, not on land. At the entrance, uh, the entrance is called Bulwarhithe, down at the bottom. Bulwarhithe means inland port of the landing place of the people. Margaret Gelling, the foremost UK place name expert, confirmed that to me. So the name says it's an inland port, but there is none there, as far as we know. Simon, the uh, expert sedimentologist, said, I, I should follow the five metre line on the Ordnance Survey. Th that would show me the sc scope of the tide and, and show me roughly where the water would have been in 1066. So we did that, and you can see we've got that. And it shows it's big, uh, it was tidal, name suggesting a port, Hastings on the right. So we can now see what the coast really looked like in 1066, not at all like it is now. A big bay at Pevensey, down in the left-hand corner, tidal, but probably like the Coombe Haven, probably not completely open to the sea, a marsh with tidal inlets. Why isn't it the same as it is now? A uh, simple answer, a, a shingle bank called the Longshore Drift suddenly changed with a big storm, the, the storm of the, what's called the storm of the millennium in 1294, and it closed Hastings, it closed Rye, it closed Winchelsea, and so we know the story of why the land has changed. So what about the biotapestry I can hear my um, opponents out there saying? That's the traditional story, the Bayer tapestry. Uh, probably made in Kent, hung in Bayer Cathedral, and unlike any other document written at that time, probably seen by everyone who was at the battle, including King William. You, you can't get a better provenance than that. And pretty clear it seems, right in the middle, at Bennett and at Pevensey, and they came to Pevensey. One thing to note is that this middle section doesn't have a border. The border starts in a new section just after where those boats break. There's a new segment there. That new segment, um, hold on, not quite as simple as it looks, because it clearly shows in the section with the border that follows the boats unloading in a different sequence. Here the soldiers go ashore, and here the soldiers hurried to Hastings to requisition food. And so here we have our first inconsistency. No mention of Pevensey Castle. Bit of an omission, largest on the south coast at the time, and Hastings is a day away from Pevensey by, by horse. 
in land belonging and controlled by Harold. So does it mean they landed at Hastings to get food? It's the rather obvious conclusion from the pictures in the tapestry. If you're going to get food when you land, um, but what about those who haven't got horses to get from Pevensey to Hastings? I'm going to skip over that just for a moment. Uh, there's a more important issue. Why sail past Hastings to get to Pevensey and then go back? Oh yes, of course, William wasn't very clever. He just happened to be a brilliant military commander who landed his fleet in front of the biggest and possibly largest defended castles on the south coast, built by the Romans, and then either walked or sailed back to Hastings, something we know he couldn't do on the tide that day because they landed on the incoming tide, as recorded in the Carmen of Hastings, which records our second inconsistency. The Carmen says, when you reach safe landing places, note it was plural, leaving the sea astern, leaving the sea astern, the third hour of the day was rising over the earth. Right, okay. The third hour of the day was 9 a.m., three hours after dawn. There were no clocks in those days. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? The text further states, robbed of her terrified inhabitants, the land destined for you, in this case Hastings and St. Leonard's, joyfully received you and yours in a calm bay. Not in the sea next to a castle, but in a calm bay. Critically, the Carmen doesn't say they landed at Pevensey, but in Furs it was at Hastings, because it names the camp at the port of Hastings later in the same text, without telling us that they've moved on. It, it adds another inconsistency by claiming that, that the Normans reinstated the forts that were previously there. Hmm. The Bayer Tapestry <coughs> appears to confirm this in some way by showing two forts, not one. Historians haven't really grasped this. They've looked at it, but they've just not seen it. You can see there is one on the left that, that appears to have a hill behind it with the, the, stri the strips that were familiar in those days of strip um, agriculture. And it's on the ground. You can see it's really on the ground where the men are. Another defensive fort can be seen at the top of the hill, later, when they start the earthworks and the ditches. The lower fort is now larger, and with the upper fort behind it, you can see those stripped fields in front of it. But that can't be Pevensey. So where? The text on the, the tapestry, this bit of the tapestry, says it's Hastings. So the Bayer tapestry isn't as straightforward as it, it might seem. Upon first impression, it, it seems clear. But there are elements that aren't explainable until now. Critics will say the Carmen isn't a very reliable document. Those critics aren't up to date with current thinking, probably because when they went to school or university, that was the case. But now, the work of Elizabeth Van Hoots in Cambridge probably the most respected Norman his historian in the world, has reinstated the authority of the Carmen, lost during the Victorian period. So those who say the Carmen doesn't count should think again. The inconsistencies remain unexplained until today. So what else have we got as primary evidence of the Norman invasion? The actual landing and camping before the battle. If you're in the world of history, everybody points to William of Poitiers. He says, thus, with a favourable wind, they all reached Pevensey, and there, without opposition, they freely disembarked. He then goes on to say, rejoicing greatly at having secured a safe landing, the Normans seized and fortified Pevensey, and then Hastings. No one in the history world disagrees with this. Just me. <laughs> Poitiers is really an important primary source because he was in William's court. And another primary source of the uh, Norman invasion, William of Germier. Germier, what does he say? He therefore, talking about William, hastily built a fleet of 3,000 ships. And crossing the sea, he landed, guess where? At Pevensey, where he immediately built a castle with a strong rampart, 
He left this in charge of some troops and with others hurries to Hastings where he wrecks another similar fortress. On the face of it, pretty straightforward. Apart from the fact historians do not believe William ever had 3,000 ships. General Fuller in his book, uh, Decisive Battles of the Western World, concluded that the number of ships could not possibly be correct because they left St. Valerie and landed in less than 12 hours. And I think everybody agrees with that. And Germier adds a further inconsistency since he claims the Normans created two castles and forts upon arrival. But there is no evidence of this. The Norman element of Pevensey Castle was built much later, and so was Hastings Castle. So Jeremy introduces the idea of two forts and castles at the time of the invasion. Interestingly, as we have seen, there are also those two on the Bayer tapestry, one shown at the top of the hill and one at the bottom, where the camp was located. But there is yet another source that says they landed at Pevensey, the Chronicle of Battle Abbey. The Chronicle of Battle Abbey is a really important document because it was the document on which the abbey uh, at battle was founded. It told the story of the invasion and the battle in the first 22 folios in one hand. It states, at length, William la landed safely near, not at, a town called Pevensey, the town called Pevensey, the army extensively along an area of shore. So in all respects, it all seems pretty clear. The story we have got at school is absolute, exactly as it was passed to us by the Victorians who debated this matter, uh, and as a result, came up with this version of history which you and every child for nearly 200 years has been taught. There is one other source which I missed, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. There are a series of chronicles detailing events over the period 1042 to 1154. The Worcester Chronicle, that says, Count William came from Normandy to Pevensey on Michaelmas Eve. As soon as he was able to move, move on, they built a castle at Hastings. So we have a pretty united front there. But... The Peterborough Chronicle says, meanwhile, Count William landed at Hastings on Michaelmas Eve. So you can see this is a bit tricky. The last primary source we shall look at was Wace and his Roman de Rue, a document written about 1160, which is claimed to be a first-hand report of the event of the landing and battle. Wace throws a complete spanner in the works because unlike the other sources, he states without any possible alternative in alternative interpretation that the fleet arrived near Hastings and their camp was at the port of Hastings. Further, in the detail, he tells how the two camps could see one another on the night before the battle and goes into some great detail of those events. Wace, like the Carmen, was written off in the Victorian age because it simply could not be made to fit what the other sources had said. It was assumed to be a 10,000 line fantasy that had foolishly been given credit before a proper assessment had been made, of course, by them. No one ever asked them why anyone would do such a thing. So there is a problem. These are the primary documents we've looked at. The Worcester Chronicle says the Normans landed at Pevensey, but the Peterborough one says Hastings. The problem is inconsistencies. The traditional story is held by Germier and Poitiers. They tell us they landed at Pevensey and built a fort there, but no fort built at the time of the invasion. Germier also infers two castles or forts were built at the same time, but the Bayer tapestry also shows two, two forts and there are none at the time at either Pevensey or Hastings Castle site. The Carmen says they reinstated the castles that were previously destroyed, yet the one in Pevensey definitely was not restored, and there wasn't one at Hastings at the time. Waste tells us on the night of the battle, the two camps could see each other, which was a major problem and ultimately undoing of that document. He also tells us they landed near Hastings and camped at the port of Hastings. Clearly, you cannot see the port, even the sea, from the site at Battle Abbey. We knew that, and the Victorians knew that. And that was the defining issue as far as they were concerned. Waste was thrown out. 
along with the carmen. This problem was identified in the Victorian age and as a result of the very huge, volatile and public debate about who was right in the historical society, we ended up with a situation where half the documents effectively were discredited. Clearly, the bio tapestry was the foremost source and in order to accommodate it, you had to disregard any information regarding to the geography or the building. So it was a cartoon. Let's, uh, let's accept it's a cartoon. It's not real. It's just a cartoon. Even though they knew that, the, uh, they knew that all the armour was right, they knew the people were there were right, but they had to disregard the ground. They had to disregard anything that wasn't just the men involved. Freeman wrote his History of the Norman Conquest and was discredited by Round in the Historical Society for using waste as the primary source for the Battle of Hastings. The fact that you could see the camp at the sea was the defining element that removed waste from the libraries of historian England. Now we shall see that the credit Round the critic ground, sorry, was inherently wrong. Wace was actually right. The thing that everyone assumed that was sacrosanct was that the abbey was built on the battlefield. The traditional story concocted by the monks at Battle Abbey. For their personal gain, I have to tell you, no one ever queried it. Because in those days, it was known that the church was infallible and never lied. Then there was another problem with the Chronicle of Battle Abbey, the one that the Abbey was founded on. The Chronicle says in the next paragraph to the one we looked at earlier about landing near the town called Pevensey. So with things going as he wished, the Duke, William, spent no time there, but made his way with his men to a nearby port called Hastings, where he found a suitable place and with foresight he quickly built a wooden fort. Now the problem with this is we're being told William landed near Pevensey and somehow managed to occupy Hastings port on the same day. Anyone who has studied the subject would know that this is not possible from the logistics. The tide was against them. This is a very important issue. They couldn't just on a ship and sail back. And so they could not return by sea and it was impossible by land on the same day. Further studies of the bio tapestry, however, show an important detail that was missed by historians. Here we see the landing sequence. Waste describes the sequence that is clearly shown in the bio tapestry. And it is known that the monks at Battle Abbey had a copy of his Roman de Rue in their library. Waste's document is an almost precise dialogue of the complete invasion and battle as shown in the bio tapestry. The two fit side by side. This is the day of the landing. It was an important day. The temporary fort had been constructed at the bottom of the hill. Men are eating chicken off their shields, as you can see. Uh, probably the first recorded kebabs. Uh, and the bishop, taking centre stage on the right, is blessing the meal, as told by Wace, to be the first meal of the landing. Clearly something everybody could remember. We home in on that. We see that the bishop is eating fish. He has a fish. And it is a canon law requirement now and also observed throughout Christendom at the time for the eating of fish on Fridays by the clergy as a sign of penance. And in, in fact, many, many, many Christians still do today. This shows conclusively that the event took place on the Friday, not in Pevensey, in Hastings. There was neither time nor tide for these events to have taken place by going to Pevensey first. Wace confirms in his dialogue that the Normans actually went to Pevensey the following day. The conclusion you cannot avoid is that the Bayer Tapestry confirms the landing at Hastings as described by Wace. How do we reconcile these events with the other documents? Now, we have a solution. Think like a Norman. Normans had no maps. That's the first thing to understand. But clearly they had spies and good knowledge of where they were going. I'm going to turn your thinking around in 10 seconds. The only areas they knew for certain were the castles. Dover controlled Rye to Deal. If you know where Rye is and Deal, Dover controlled that area. Pevensey Castle controlled Rye to Winchester. Now shift your understanding, think like a Norman, Pevensey was the area in every reference you have looked at. Not our understanding of a town. Hastings was the landing site and the port in every reference. 
If we look at this, the Worcester Chronicle from, says they arrived from Normandy to Pevensey on Michaelmas Eve, and as soon as he was able to move on, they built a castle at Hastings, right? They arrived at the Pevensey area, and they moved on. Pevensey area meaning Hastings and the port. The Peterborough Chron Chronicle, Chronicle says, meanwhile, Count William landed at Hastings on Michaelmas Eve. Yes, he did, it, but it was still the Pevensey area. The Bayer Tapestry says they're going ad Pevensey. They're going to the Pevensey area, and then landing at Hastings exactly as you see it every time you look at it you will now understand that the carmen you leave the sea behind them and they camped and landed at hastings this you can only do this at hastings because it's an inland port in a hive you leave the sea behind you poitiers says the normans seized and fortified pevensey and then hastings now this is this is interesting they seized and fortified pevensey and then hastings if you read waste this is actually technically correct because they arrived at hastings pevensey they even if you want to take the obscure definition of them not making the fort on the first day they then went to pevensey the next day and fortified that, and then Hastings, because that's where they actually finished their work. So even Poitiers is effectively saying they arrived in Hastings. Wace says the day following the landing, they go to Pevensey to secure the castle, we know that. And Germier says he landed at Pevensey. Now we remember we're all thinking Pevensey isn't the castle, it is the area where he immediately built a castle. And the Chronicle of Battle Abbey, they landed safely near the town called Pevensey. Well, yes, because it was in the Pevensey area. And Wace, well, of course, we know he was right because they arrived near Hastings uh, and their camp was at the port of Hastings. He didn't beat about the bush and call it the Pevensey area. Suddenly, the really amazing thing that happens that historians have just can't understand is all of the inconsistencies disappear. We have a whole bunch of, of documents that are all telling us the same story. No inconsistencies relating to the landing and the camp. Once you adapt your thinking to take this into account, a miracle happens. Yes, no inconsistencies. All the documents agree. What does it mean? It means none of the sources lied to obtain favours, as has been hypothesised by historians for 200 years. It means they all contain valuable information that should not be ignored because they don't fit how you used to think. They all told the story from the perspective of the original sources. What is absolutely clear is the Normans landed and camped at the port of Hastings. So, if we find the fort, we find the start of the Battle of Hastings. Because the Bayer Tapestry is a complete record of everything that the Normans did from the point that they landed. The idea that this is applied to a town a long way away from the battle site is not true. It's very close to the battle site, and the ground is shown on the tapestry. So, before we get there, we've got another myth to crack. The, the myth we have to deal with, like the one concerning the landing at Pevensey, was also, strangely enough, created by the Victorians, who sought to reconcile their understanding of the documents they believed in. The port and castle was at the Hastings Castle site. Faced with the castle being built on the massive cliffs and headlands, the Victorians interpret this to mean the camp must have been where the castle was erected, because this is what the Bayer Tapestry was telling them. The fact the castle was in wood in the Bayer Tapestry didn't matter because it must have been replaced by a stone one later. The fact there was no mound or evidence to support this was explained by guessing that erosion had removed all the evidence. So here's the myth. Convenient, but this is what historians do best. They make it up if they can't find the evidence. Only to have the right answer come along later, then they all agree. It takes time, and that's the process we're in now. Now, we have the archaeological survey of the shopping centre under the castle, conveniently commissioned by Hastings Council not very long ago, because it was believed that under the air of the castle was the original port. And this has been written in history, so to speak. But they wanted to build on it, so they had to do a survey. That showed categorically that the valley below the castle 
was never tidal, had always been a freshwater marsh, and that the shingle bank across the entrance to the valley had always been there. Further, Simon Jennings, remember our sedimentologist, explained to me that yes, we all know there has been coastal erosion, but really very little in the last thousand years because there is a petrified forest less than 50 metres offshore, which anyone who lives here has probably seen at low tide. You don't get petrified forests under chalk cliffs. So, end of myth. So historians who haven't looked very carefully at these things, please don't keep repeating those completely false stories in, in support of the site of a mythical port where the Count of U built his castle, the port of Hastings, was the largest of the five sank ports because it was the biggest. It was there where the king held his fleet in early times. The men of Hastings who sailed the fleet were called barons and carried the king into his coronation and they operated the fleet out of Bulverhide. There is a lot of evidence for this in the written record. I haven't got time to go into it all now, of course it's in my book. There is reference to salt works at the port and the salt works are at Bulverhide. Remember, the landing place of the people at the inland port. It's that port served the Romans, who occupied the whole area around, around the largest iron production in the southeast at Beauport Park, and, and before that, the communities who occupied the Coomhaven Valley in the Iron and Bronze Ages. Finding the location of the port confirms the invasion site, because now we understand the, all the source documents but we understand they're all saying the same thing. They're telling us it was the landing site of the Norman invasion. Well, by a remarkable bit of luck, the Chronicle of Battle Abbey names the site of the port of Hastings where the Normans camped. I cannot find any historian who has a reason to disagree with this evidence. The site is named as Hedgeland. No one could find it. No one probably looked. The monks created it in 1180 on their own land, nowhere near the sea or, or the port, as part of the deception that, that we'll talk about later. So where is it? It's on the site of an inland waterway, now at Upper Wil Wilting Farm, in the parish of Crowhurst. You can see the red bit, that's Upper Wilting Farm, it's about 200 acres um, north of the Coombe Haven, uh, and the little bit that's where the square bit in the bottom corner of Upper Wilting Farm is, Regland Wood. So this is where the hunt for the Normans started, here at Regland Wood. I thought about this, Old English Hedgeland, and this is Regland at the Port of Hastings. Let's just have a look at that. Yes, Old English, Ridge, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, H-Y-C-G, Old English Hedge, H-E-C-G. The name Hedgeland and the name Regland are so similar in text that a translation error in the Chronicle of Battle Abbey is absolutely certain because of what we find there. The fact that the Chronicle named the port at the site uh, and the location of Regland Wood is exactly where the port should be. It cannot be a coincidence because the ditches and post holes at that site indicate this really is where William camped. There is an earthed up in inlet next to where the in invasion took place explaining another part of the mystery of the invasion. Waste tells us that the ships were dim dismantled and drawn ashore. This is actually alluded to in the tapestry. Here you can see the boats being pulled ashore, but the chronicle, and, and if you look at the, the bottom section of the fort, the, the temporary fort, you, you've got those sort of post hole, those, those sort of hole structures that are on the sides of the boat. Is it a coincidence? I don't think so because Waste tells us that they dismantled the ships. Whereas the Chronicle of Battle Abbey says William ordered most of the ships to be burnt. However, the Carmen is different from both of those, stating, fearing to lose the ships, you surrounded them with earth earthworks and guarded the shores. Shores in the plural, and some sort of earthing up process, so, so there was no escape. At the inlet next to Regland Wood, we have an inlet that's been earthed up. There, clearly, there is the presence of charcoal and explains how three separate elements of the same story, all probably true. Earthed up by one chronicler, because he sees the earthing up process going on, burnt by another, because he sees the burning going on, and dismantled by a third, because he witnessed that. It, it doesn't mean you have one version that's right and two that's wrong. They're all right, because it was the perspective of the person 
observing the events when you apply it to the, to the right place. Once this understanding comes together, we now know that all the documents we have examined have an absolute authenticity that cannot be denied. There's no longer any cons inconsistencies when they're all applied to the right site. You must remember that no one has ever claimed that there is a historical landing site at Pevensey. Even the signs at Pevensey Castle do not claim the Normans landed there, because in truth, there is no evidence to support that on the ground. So what happened next? My first research involved the Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book is a unique record of the manor values in the country recorded in about 1085. It was recorded in order to, to show who owned what and in order to raise taxes. It stated the values of the manors before, during and after the invasion. It has always been a mystery as to why some of the manors were wasted and others not. Until now. There seems no way of explaining why some manners were wasted by the Normans and others were not. The values attributed did not appear to have a recognisable pattern. Elizabeth Van Hoots, commenting upon the first half of my book when it was published in 1998, said it was the most important aspect of my work up until then. The reason being, it provides quantitative ev evidence that has never been challenged by any historian of exactly where the Normans landed. She accepted the hypothesis that it was probably at Wilting Manor, the conclusion I reached then. The first thing I did was do an analysis of the Doomsday Manor values and allocate them geographically according to the roads that probably existed at that time, plotted in accordance with distance from Wilting in a direct line on the map, which is what we have here. You can see, broadly speaking, that the manu values on the right get higher the further away from Wilting Manor on the immediate left. Those on the right are in, in the Pevensey area are green. However, you can see this isn't very clear because right in the middle, ST2, which is Higham near Winchelsea, there's one of no value at all, which is um, also wasted and no value. So I took the same values and plotted them according to the roads of the time to Pevensey. In order to do that, you have to establish the route that the Normans took. This is defined by the geography and the old property development that we know has come along since. Note there are no property, there's, there's no property between Tellum Hill and Battle. The road was impassable by ox cart. Tellum Hill yeah. is there, that's it, to Battle, where that dotted line is. There is no property in there. This is because a detour was necessary. There was no ridge road in those days. The ridge road was created when the turnpike came in in, in, in 1750. The original London to Hastings Road went where that dotted line is up the top there. When this route is applied to, the, to Doomsday, you, you realise that when the Normans went to Pevensey, they had to turn left at Tellum Hill because ox carts could not take the things that they needed up a very steep hill that is on the Hastings to Battle Road. And at that crossroads, they turned left and went to Broomham, Ninfield, Boreham Wood, Hurstman Zoo, all the way round to Pevensey. So what happens when we apply that to our values of the Doomsday um, Manors? But it's an almost perfect summary of what you would expect from the centre of the operations of an invading army. The further away from the landing and the camp, the less wastage of the manors involved. But this Doomsday evidence tells us more than this, something that points the finger to the real battlefield site. When I did this work 20 years ago, I didn't know why this anom anomaly was there. Now we do. If we look at the specific value of manors at the time of Doomsday, 1086, north of the Coombehaven Valley, and compare them to their pre-invasion value, we get this. And what it shows is, is the manors that took the longest to recover. Hastings, Filsham, Hollington, Bullington, Wilton, Crowhurst, Catsfield, Battle, Broomham, Ninfield, uh, and, and, it, and it goes on to Watlington. The two wa most wasted manors, 20 years after the battle in 1086, are Wilting, where they camped, and Crowhurst. I didn't understand that at the time, but now we know it is where the battle took place. This is not a coincidence. Let's look at the manor values overall. This shows clearly that battle was not the battle site because it wasn't wasted enough compared to those around it. And there had to be a reason for this. Red is the most wasted and green is the least wasted. 
and the colours in between. Pevensey, as you can see, was virtually untouched. Waste was right. They went there for a day to check it out, but it was a day after the landing, hence the low values. Too far to go back and forth daily collecting supplies. Wastage radiates from Wilting and Crowhurst. Battle Town did not exist then. And we don't know what was there. It was hardly touched. And the reason was the London Road from Crowhurst had two very difficult valleys north of the Tellum Ridge. Historians don't know that. They don't go there. But you just go and look. You try and get an ox cart up and down there with your, waste, with your uh, battle stuff that you've knocked off down the road. You won't get it home. And so they didn't go down there. They turned left and they turned right. And they seem to have turned right most of the time, as we can see from the, from the colours. Taking this information and applying it to the geography of the area was the key to understanding what happened. This is the land with the high ground marked red and the spot heights are marked. We've got spot heights at Wilting, spot heights in the middle of Crowhurst. Wilting is 40, this is metres. Uh, Crowhurst is 10 and it goes actually to zero in some places in Crowhurst. The ridge, it then goes up to 120 metres, and in no time at all, it drops down to 60 metres. And at battle, it's 85 metres. Impossible for ox carts and provisions uh, or stones to build an abbey. There was no ridge road from battle to the old town Hastings in those days. There is really no evidence that the old town of Hastings existed at all where it is today. It is a mystery unless you believe that the old town of Hastings was located at Wilting Manor before the invasion by the port, where the Normans, they actually installed their first sheriffs there. The first sheriffs of Hastings were at Wilting Manor. It would seem exceedingly strange to put the, the first sheriffs there if Hastings was somewhere else. Even the Doomsday Book has no entry for Hastings, which is assumed to have been destroyed by the Normans and, was pro and probably was at the port down by the Coombe Haven. Okay, this is probably the most important information you need to know without reading my book. It's a document upon which the Abbey a Battle was founded. In, in the middle of the 1100s, uh, the Abbey got into trouble with the King because it wasn't paying tax. The first 22 pages in, were written in one hand and then another takes over. It was the start of the Age of Enlightenment when paper was taking over from the age when a man's word was his bond. So when the King went, uh, wanted to be paid, the, the monks needed a document to support their case. It was no longer good enough to say, oh, we were promised it. because. There was no evidence to support it. There was no reference to the oath in the Bayer tapestry. Now we know the church, now we know the church created a charter and the chronicle followed about 30 years later. This was well researched by Eleanor Searle. She concluded it had become the natural commencement of their own story and a, tradi a tradition that even the fastidious chronicler was willing to foist upon his successors as truth, a lie, as he must have known, but one that would be harmless to, to their interests in years to come. The monks could not lie about the first 22 pages because these contained unique information that was true and supported their case. All they could do was copy those first 22 pages and insert the elements that were, that were not true as tradition. So the, the document would read that William was putting his tunic on at his camp at a place called Hedgeland, which lies towards Hastings, uh, and, and they defined the hill. Now we know this is correct. But then the chronicle would go on and say, and tradition says, if God willing, I live, I shall endow that abbey with the supply of wine that will be more abundant than the water of any other great abbey. Well, eyebrows raised, raised, I see. If you really think about what is written, it doesn't take too long to realise that it was very doubtful that William was thinking about giving the monks free wine at the time he was on the battlefield making his oaths. Every time the monks refer to tradition, it's their way of lying. It's as simple as that. That way, no one could be blamed. After all, it was tradition. 
pretty clever. The Chronicle tells the story of William making an oath at his camp in Folio 10. Specifically, it says, and to strengthen the hands and hearts of those who are about to fight for me, I make this vow that on this very battlefield I shall found a monastery for the salvation of all, especially those who fall here. However, there is no reference to William burying Harold at the top of any hill, as stated on the English Heritage website on the other day when they were challenged. William clearly understood himself to be on the battlefield, even at his camp, at the port. The monks invented the instructions to place the marker where the standard fell as part of the tradition. As we have seen earlier, it tells us where the Normans camped, and that camp at the port at a hill called Hedgeland, a place the monks created at the time of the charter in their own lands, and they created every other place mentioned in the document in their own lands, including a place called Hurst, as part of the deception. What is in the, the Chronicle next came as a complete surprise to me, bearing in mind I had roughly read it 20 years before, and it was in relation to the battlefield, which I wasn't looking at then, I was looking at the invasion. The monks needed to explain to the king why the abbey was not started straight away. This was pretty important. If the oath really did take place, why wait six or seven years to start it? Here it was. Without an explanation, the case for free taxes and wine would fail. It was explained that a monk named Smith came from Marmoutier in France with four others six or seven years after the battle. The monks explain that the abbey was started, but it was not a suitable place. The exact words describing where the abbey was originally started are included in the text. It states, they studied the battlefield and decided that it seemed hardly suitable for so outstanding a building. They therefore chose a fit place for settling, a site located not far off, but somewhat lower down towards the western slope of the ridge. There, lest they seem to be doing nothing, they built themselves some little huts. This site, i.e. the battlefield, still called Hurst, has a low stone wall as a mark of this. So there in the Chronicle of Battle Abbey, we are told that the abbey was originally built on the battlefield at Hurst, where the low stone wall was, and it was moved from the battlefield to where it is today. That is why they had waited all that time. And it tells us from the horse's mouth, so to speak, exactly where the Battle of Hastings was really fought, at Hurst, where the low stone wall was. Stone walls were unusual in those days because this was before the Normans arrived with their stone building skills. Everything was made from wood. Hurst means wood in Old English. And there are lots of hearsts in Sussex, including one created by the monks to cover their story, north-northwest of the ridge that surrounds Hastings. But that was a wood, and it wasn't low down on the west of the ridge. Why anyone would consider that the Battle of Hastings took place in a wood is difficult to understand, other than that was what the Normans knew the name Hurst to mean. However, that did not seem important to the monks because they put Hedgeland on the ridge and nowhere near the port. There was probably an underlying belief that no one, apart from the abbot, would ever see these original documents. And as long as the places existed within their own land, it did not matter where the real places were, as long as their existence supported their claim. But unknown to the Normans, there was one hearst that already existed and was low down on the west side of the ridge as the chronicle details. But the Normans didn't know that the local Sussex dialect for the name Crowhurst was pronounced Crust by the locals. Sounds just like Hurst to a Norman French ear and even to ours today. So what do we have in Crust? Funny, we have a low stone wall incorporated into the enclosure that where the church was built. Why do, believe, why do we believe this is several thousand years old and predates the church and the invasion? Because of the yew. This is an extremely well-researched tree. 
that has been dated by Alan Meredith, the foremost yew tree expert, as 2,000 plus years old. That means it was 1,000 years old when the Normans were here. Why is it that old? Because the roots are bound into the old wall and confined between what is now where the church building is and the wall was part of what's called an enclosure. The two have therefore coexisted for at least a thousand years. It was impossible to build the wall later. An enclosure was a place where men met before the churches existed. And the Christians used those places to build their churches in early times. There is still a circle of yews in the graveyard, and the site probably has ancient Celtic origins. And why do we believe this is the hearst written down by the battle monks on the site of the Battle of Hastings? Because of what's next to the, the wall and the yew. We have a ruin, the ruins of the start of the original Battle Abbey, which was built in the six or seven years before the monk called Smith moved in. The ruin was originally believed to be 13th century because of the window, which was added later. But hold on, that 18th century evaluation is clearly wrong. Recent archaeology confirms this is a very large, two-story ecclesiastical building with buttresses, exactly as Battle Abbey was believed to be. The, the real Battle Abbey was demolished at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. Looking at the lower levels inside the building, this is what we see. Not obvious, because they're not faced. 11th century Norman arches, exactly as built into the larger undercroft building at Battle Abbey, which here has the facing stones. But the floor plan, that exactly matches the original Abbey built, building built later in battle. The blue square is the bit that remains above ground. This is evidence of exactly where the original Battle Abbey was built. Those foundations confirm the battlefield site. And to be honest, you can't get much better evidence than that to confirm the site of the Battle of Hastings. Where else are the foundations of the earlier abbey, which was built for seven years before it was moved? Nowhere. They could move most of the abbey stone, but they couldn't move the foundations, and they built the new manor on it. And what else have we found at Crowhurst uh, in the valley battlefield since we started to look? Just about see it. This is the battlefield, which runs from Wilting Farm at the bottom, at the, on the edge of Hastings, as the Queen's Way to the Ridge. Uh, and the old London Road marched in red dots. This site is much bigger than the Battle Abbey field. It includes the landing and campsite of the invasion, as well as the battlefield, all in one valley. On top right, you can see the view, just about, from that field, a clear line of sight from the, the port camp as de described by Waste to Tellum Ridge. One road that runs off of the peninsula of which William had landed. It was confined on two sides. There was no way round making William's cavalry impotent once Harold had enclosed the fields on the main battlefield hill, as Waste tells us he did. The Chronicle of Battle Abbey tells us there was fighting going on for a considerable distance, with a great number of Norman knights died towards the end of the battle. It was called the Malfoss, and, and was described as just where the fighting was going on. Uh, an immense ditch yawned. This is completely missing from the, the Abbey battlefield site. Uh, but here it is, running right down the right-hand side of the battlefield, confining uh, both the Normans and the Saxons, and forcing everything into a very tight area in the middle of the, top, uh, of the hill that, that rises the 120 metres, an exceptionally difficult fight for the Normans. The discovery of the battlefield and the Malfoss, exactly where it is expected to be, adds to our knowledge of the Battle of Hastings. So now we knew where to look. We go beyond that to what have we found. Here we, we have the site of the main battlefield at the bottom, the great field at Crowhurst that runs from the bottom of the hill to, the, to 120 metres height. We have found three large defensive ditches in the great field at Crowhurst, more or less where we are standing from that photograph. A field that runs from the bottom of the valley to the top, and not present at the, the Battle Abbey site. This is where the bio-tapestry shows Harold first see the, sees the Normans appear over rising ground. 
and, and clearly, standing there, you can see the rising ground, where Harold is shown in the bio tapestry with his back to a tree, with stones in its branches. This came as a bit of a surprise. Indeed, there is, we had to look at the trees, a series of trees in the bio tapestry, each different, showing at each point in the battle. The starting tree, at top left, is where they leave port. Notice there's water in the branches, in the middle, what looks like water. The Saxon scout sees the Norman camp uh, on, on the sees, sees the Normans in their camp. No, note the brown wiggly wiggle in the tree uh, on the hillside, which would have been Wilting Hill. This notifies us that there was agricultural ground on that site, ploughed, as shown in the battlefield sequence also on the hill. Harold sees the Norman Normans arrive later on with his back to another tree and stones in the branches. This is where Waste tells us they arrived over the plain. The stones in the branches are, of course, the low stone wall, which were mentioned in other documents. At the end of the battle, there's a hole in a tree, tree with a hole in. What does that mean? Well, it means it's old, it's got a hole through the middle of it. It's the hoary apple tree. And can you see there is an apple actually falling from the tree? And the, Sax the Saxon Chronicles called it the Battle of the Hoary Apple Tree. Why? Uh, because it was a landmark. They knew these things as they were going to and from for, two, for their six weeks. And what is the name of the top field at Crowhurst, which is the borough boundary? Apple Tree Field. Strange. Coincidence? No. There are 19 similar examples around the country where apple trees were, were planted as borough boundary markers, so that when you were on the road, you knew when you were passing into a new borough. The one at Crowhurst was clearly important. It was the hoary apple tree. It was old, rickety, and had holes in it, a hole through it. And they drew it on the bio tapestry. Uh, and here we have Google Maps, and we have those ditches. They're clearly visible, but hidden in the landscape of the battlefield. Uh, all those little markers are things that we've been finding and working on. These ditches have no reason to be there except in order to force William to fight on foot. Uh, William had fought in France with Harold. He knew that how devastating their cavalry could be. These people, they had tanks, the equivalent of tanks, these massive horses. He knew he had to do something or they were mincemeat. And so he enclosed the field, he built the ditches, and he puts the, put the stake across the field, the stakes across the field. These ditches were there to stop the horse. And they explain why the account that Harold enclosed the fields is correct, and the battle took all day. This is a big battlefield, much bigger than Battle Abbey. We're looking here at the section below the railway line. There's another section, equally large, above the railway line. Close up, just to show you that I'm not making it up. Run through, there's two ditches. I can't see them from here, you might be able to see them from the back, but they run through here. The dark green, and they, they run through there. They sort of disappear here, but they actually run right the way through. Sensible move by Harold. The closer you get, you can see those ditches, and, and you have to go to Google. Go to the middle of Crowhurst, have a look at the field, you'll see. Here we have the top of the hill, above the railway line, the top half of the battlefield. Uh, the Malfoss, that green uh, woodland, is not woodland, it's a massive ditch. Massive in places. 20 or 30 feet high. You just wouldn't know it was there. The Malfoss bridge just behind the Saxon defence line. So Saxon defence line runs across here. The field comes in here and out down there. So, and there's something else here. Uh, the, the Malfoss Bridge, where, this, where we believe this event took place, is right here, right behind this Saxon defence line. There's a, a, a path that leads across there and out to Tellum, and you just wouldn't know it was there, unless you were, happened to be camped there, and a bridge across the ravine. And clearly the Saxons knew about this. Normans didn't, they were just there fighting for the day. So when they scarpered off the field, they followed them. But they didn't follow them, they followed them through the undergrowth and went straight into this ravine. Here, the ditch that we've identified runs across here, and this is a close-up of the defence line. And the, we found a crossbow there. I never was good at dancing. We found a crossbow, a, a very early crossbow, a bit difficult to see, uh, technically a footbow, or what we believe is the Saxon defence line. 
There's no metallic response, but definitely a very early footbow, identified by a military historian from Eastbourne. What's it doing in this field if it isn't connected to the Battle of Hastings? Slightly better photo. And if you look carefully, uh, th this is a depth of about 80 centimetres. It's quite, this is really deep in terms of excavations. You can see that there's other stuff around. What happens with metal things, iron things, and we're dealing with an iron period here, um, the irons migrate into the soil over time and, and they lose their magnetic signature because uh, first of all they become rust, then the rust disappears completely and it gets replaced by phosphates. So what you get left with is a perfect image of what was there, but if you try and lift it, it will just, it'll be like Dracula's grave, it'll just disappear in, in your hands. It's not excavatable, but it is recoverable using specialist uh, people and techniques. If we look at the biotapestry, we can see details that we never knew before that were correct about the road and the land between the port and battle, exactly as it is in real life. Uh, the stream, uh, the place where the stream is, the horses falling in at the bottom of the hill, and a hill, an agricultural hill of course, that goes right to the top. These have caused a bit of con controversy. Um, we found what we believe are two Norman helmet rims. I'm not sure they're both Norman. One might be Norman, one might be Saxon. Uh, the problem is they're found in the stream below a 13th century horseshoe. The stream runs right down the side of the site and it's deep in silt. It's anaerobic and so it's a fantastic resource for holding interesting objects. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of metal in there, but what we found, what we know absolutely for certain, these are not beer um, barrel rings or coke cans, as has been suggested to me. Um, they've got rivet holes. Now, the, they've got two rivet holes. The problem with Norman helmets is we think, because at the reenactments you see them all the time, that's what a Norman helmet looks like. Well, yes, they did in the 14th century. Uh, that's more or less how they were made. But the early ones, we don't have any. There are only, I think, 14 or 16 in existence from the 13th century. What we've got is an understanding that the original Norman helmets were, you know, like coconuts, um, hit with metal, um, shaped, and all we know is that the very early ones had three holes in them. They had one hole on either side and a hole at the top. And the only thing that the experts can conclude from this is that something else fitted on the helmet. We had some sort of visor or something for holding chain mail in place. What they've got is they've got the, th this has the two rivets on in the place where you'd expect them to be. But they're actually on the outside, which means that the conical must have gone over the top. And I believe, and there's also a, a, a mark on the front suggesting that the nose guard was actually attached to this as, as, part, as, as, a, as an extra part of it. And of course it went over your head and inside it was padded and it would have the, the what we understand to be a, a Norman helmet. It's caused a great deal of difficulty because we can't find an expert who knows what one looks like. So when you show it to them, they will say, well, I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, and, and because archaeology is often identified by where it's found. So if you find a uh, horseshoe in a Saxon village, then you know, well, it's probably going to be a Saxon horseshoe. Um, if you find an implement in a Saxon village, it'll be a, and you can date it from the structure of its position. When you find things in streams in the middle of nowhere, uh, next to battlefields, then it's very difficult to get anyone to agree anything. But they're there, and we're trying to get somebody from France to have a look at them in the hope that maybe there is something in France. Our second one is slightly different construction, more or less the same, but it's got an inner ring where the inner ring is still in it. And it looks like it may be copper, and it may, be, it may have been the original copper helmet element that went, in this case, it appears to go inside the ring. We've got some sort of personal item from the lower battlefield. We've, we've found things like crossbow bolts. They look like bolts, but they, it's very difficult to know exactly. Embellishments uh, of iron embellishments. A spear tip, uh, uh, some sort of alloy tip that has clearly gone into something and been cut off by an axe. Well, of course, if a spear hits you in the shield, you'd whack it off with your with your axe, and that's what this looks like. Lots of bronze bits, 
Uh, bronze lasts quite well in this environment. The story was always told to me that nothing survives in this country that long. And I lived with that for 25 years, never even looked. But actually, this isn't true. We're starting to find, if you're in the right place, you find the stuff that supports the site. Uh, and that's what we're doing at the moment. Flat lead shot, possibly from a ballista. Masses and masses of metal, which well, I, I'm not going to show you all of that because it, it, there's, there's, there's so much of it. This is a, a horsehead stick, um, which I've got with me. I'll show that to you when you see it later. We found a fossilised bone in the Malfoss. Don't know what it is. Nobody can identify it. Doesn't seem to be human. Doesn't seem to... Might be a horse. Might be a badger, but again, fossilised. Rather strange to find this stuff. The Malfoss stream is a massive resource. Um, so far, uh, we haven't uh, even tapped into it. This is a LiDAR scan. This is interesting. It wasn't available until recently. LiDAR, light detecting and ranging. It's done with a radar um, type device from a plane. The colours indicate height. Blue is the highest. Uh, clearly visible are the three defensive ditches at the Upper Norman Camp, uh, if you know what you're looking at, uh, and I will show you. One ditch runs straight across there, parallel to <coughs> this. This ditch is plainly obvious because it's right in front of an earthworks. But there's another ditch, that one there, there's ditch here, ditch there. There is a, th a third ditch here, which runs around here, down here and down there. There are parallel ditches in here and parallel ditches in there. It was quite a big defensive operation. They were there for some time and, and they got it together. There are also post holes along the front of the earthworks and masses of medieval nails around the earthworks, confirming the presence, in our view, of a large fence. And we have the, the, defense, the defensive ditches for the very first Norman fort. I mean, you're working with very uh, marginal information here, but you can see this is the ditch that runs around here, but it's visible. We know it's there now. The inspector, 1998 public inquiry, was told there was nothing here. We now know he was badly advised. Uh, here are the post holes uh, and ditches of the top fort site, which we found in 1998. Um, this has been going on 25 years. Um, dealing with the, the issues of this site. There's a lot of information for this site. The, the road builders said then to the inspector that there's no archaeology on this site. Now we know the inspector was seriously misinformed. LIDAR uh, was not available then. It is now. And we can see the ditches in, in the norm of defence um, on the scans too. So what have we got so far? Confirmation that the Battle of Hastings was not at Battle Abbey from the Chronicle. Unchallenged doomsday evidence that confirms the battle and the invasion site at Crowhurst and Wilting. Confirmation from the Chronicle of Battle Abbey that identifies the correct site of the Battle of Hastings in Crowhurst. Confirmation from the Chronicle of Battle Abbey that Wilting Farm was the site of the Norman invasion tying in Regland Wood to the Hedgeland in the Chronicle. A new understanding that Pevensey, in those documents, refers to the areas controlled by the castles. This new understanding removes all the inconsistencies from all documents written within 180 years of the battle if applied to the Crowhurst and Wilting Manor sites. Uh, an excavation identifying a very early crossbow located on the Saxon defence line. Three man-made defensi defensive ditches enclosing the battlefield as confirmed by Wace. The Malfoss, where it is supposed to be right where the, di where the fighting is going on, and is. The earthworks and defensive Norman ditches at the top of Wilting, where the Normans landed. The foundations of the original uh, abbey started immediately after the battle on the battlefield, which is confirmed in the chronicle where the abbey was started before it was moved. Probably the most important information we have. A lower fort at Wilting where the Normans created the first Norman camp with associated ditches. We've got an inlet where William is supposed to have earthed up his ships and or burnt them with an earthworks blocking the entrance and charcoal inside. Two fort sites at the landing site identified in the Bio Tapestry and by Jumier. 
Uh, we've got two metal helmet rims found in the Malfoss next to the battlefield. We've got a mass of associated debris from possible battlefield activity. At least one metal alloy uh, type spear tip cut off. Um, the discovery of Wace's plane not present at, at Battle Abbey. The confirmation that Apple Tree Field was where the ancient hoary apple tree once stood on the borough boundary as the local marker of the battlefield. Uh, an understanding of why the, the battle was called the Battle of Hastings, uh, because it was the valley that served Hastings Port, not the other side of the ridge. A new understanding of the complete authenticity of the bio tapestry, which has the ground and trees exactly as seen on the correct battlefield. The bio tapestry identifies both the battlefield and the camp and port once either is confirmed, uh, because it is a true representation of the geography of the battlefield, uh, an understanding of why the lie relating to the battlefield was created, and how history forgot the truth for us to find 966 years later. So let me explain some facts of life in regards to the conf confirming